This is the We Get Outdoors podcast. My name is Rob Yates, I am your host, and welcome to this episode. In this episode, we get to know Maya and Aladino from the YouTube channel Sailing Magic Carpet. In this episode, we discuss how to balance the world when you have so much of your world on view on YouTube, how to follow through on your resolutions, what the missed moments are they wish they'd filmed surviving a lightning storm at sea, and how you can get out there and live the life of your dreams starting with almost nothing. These amazing people took and renovated a shipwreck and turned it into a boat that you could easily cruise around the world in. If you're interested about how you can turn your dreams into your reality, then this is the episode for you. This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe, where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth and become part of a tribe of like-minded outdoor enthusiasts, sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips and insights, and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. Click on the link in the description below to join for free right now. So Maya and Aladino, um, I feel like I know you two already. I've been following your YouTube channel since pretty much the first edition. And um, that puts me at an advantage and a disadvantage because it's really important, I think, that the people who are listening to this get to know who you are, where you come from, uh, how you've ended up being here in the first place. Um, and uh, I already know the answers to some of those questions. <laughs> so welcome to the We Get Outdoors podcast. Thank you so much. We're so excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So I, I'm going to throw a really open question for you to just waffle your way through as we start. How do we end up with a, uh, a Swiss guy, a Canadian girl, living on a boat called Magic Carpets somewhere in the Mediterranean south of Europe? How does that all happen and come together? <laughs> um, do you want to start or shall I start with this one? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I'll, I'll start with this one. Okay, so yeah, I'm Canadian. I grew up and lived my entire life in Canada, and I actually didn't travel a lot as a kid. But I read a lot of books, and my thing was that I would go to the library, and I, I would go to the tra- travel section, and my only rule is that I would choose a book about something that I knew the very least about. And one day I went to the library and there was a book there about sailing and it was written by a girl about my age. She was 16 and I think I was about 13 or 14 at the time. And it was about her solo circumnavigation around the globe. And I was like, well, this sounds cool. I don't know anything about sailing. And I picked up that book. It was Maiden Voyage by Tanya Abe or Abi. And I read it and I was absolutely hooked. And from that moment on, I was like, okay, well, that's my new goal. I want to sail around the world. I want to live on a boat. And when I went to university, I figured I would kind of put that dream on hold for a bit while I got my bachelor's. But just as it happened, in the second year of university, this is all in Canada, I, this, this is a long story, and I don't think I'll go into it, but I ended up getting a, a boat given to me for $1. And I fell absolutely in love with that boat. I fixed it up. I made it my own. I lived on it for the last few years of university. And I, from that point on, it was just even more solidified in my mind that I wanted to be a sailor. So after I graduated with my bachelor's, I got a job on a tall ship in the Mediterranean. And I was sailing around the Mediterranean on this tall ship. And I met this very handsome young man on his own boat. He was also sailing in the same area, but on his own boat. And we talked a little bit, we stayed in contact. And then after I was finished my work contract on the tall ship, I went to go visit him in Switzerland. And obviously it was, it was Aladino. <laughs> and uh, I've been with him ever since. But Aladino had his own story leading up to that as well about boats. Do you want to talk a little bit about Miguel? Or yeah, totally. Uh, for my part instead, it was a progression of things um, just from how I grew up. Uh, because I've never had anything to do with sailing before I was uh, 20. But it was a bit, I still call it a progression, and everything led into it because I grew up traveling a lot with my parents. Uh, We cruised all over 
Europe and a lot in the States and in Canada, just growing up in an RV and being outdoor all the time and really valuing travel and different cultures and languages and being outdoor. That was, that was my start. And um, I was really into cycling. So I've done a few bigger cycling trips. And on one of those bicycling trips, I met sailors and one of them actually became my mentor. And uh, he told me about one, one specific part of sailing, which was actually more accessible to me because uh, before in Switzerland, I only knew that it's uh, yeah more uh, something reserved to, to the rich because it costs quite a bit of money. But when I knew about the part of sailing where you can be a liveaboard or more kind of the hippie kind of sa- the hippie way of sailing, <laughs> then I absolutely fell in love with it, and I was like, I gotta give this uh, give this a go. So that's how I ended up on my first sailboat. Um, I pretty much switched from bicycle to sailboat on a trip that I was on at the time. So I was um, cycling down the west coast of uh, the United States. And I made it all the way to Mexico, thinking to continue down into South America. But having met my mentor, Miguel, yeah, as I said, we actually made it possible to find me my first boat. And uh, I switched. And that's why I said it is a progression, because I've never thought of sailing at first. But um, it all led to sailing in the end. So, yeah, now um, I think our stories join, because after that inspiring trip, where I realized sailing is a possibility, I went back to Switzerland and started an apprenticeship, actually as a boat builder, because I wanted to make this lifestyle possible. And I was in Switzerland, finished the apprenticeship, and I was working on my own boat. And that's uh, where our stories got together. Yeah. So your boat was pretty much a shipwreck. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. When, when, when you first got it, tell us tell us about that the the shipwreck through to where it is now. So yeah, let me introduce Magic Carpet. Uh, not it. It's not. Um, oh. Not everybody realizes this, but actually, my name in Italian is Aladdin. It's Aladino, which means Aladdin, and that's why our boat uh, makes perfect sense that it's named Magic Carpet. It is our personal private island <laughs> to fly around from place to place. <laughs> but, but yeah, unfortunately, its first flight was a bit of a scary one, and that was before I owned it. It fell from a crane from the second story, so that was six meters, and it fell onto concrete. So there was a pretty harsh landing and pretty much the idea was to gut the boat, sell the parts, but then I came into place and I started my apprenticeship in that boatyard where the mishap happened and I saw the boat and I asked uh, what's, uh, yeah, what the idea was and uh, pretty much um, I thought it has to float again and I bought it and fixed it up. It took four years. Um, it was quite a job but now it's the boat we live on full time and uh, we sail around the med. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you brushed over this quite quickly, but um, I'm sure the listeners will go onto your YouTube channel. In fact, I'd encourage them to and go back to one of your videos where you show the pictures of magic carpet when it was a shipwreck. Um, just how bad was it smashed up when you started working on it? So there's a few um, boating specific terms, but yeah, pretty much the rear end, the stern of a boat was completely missing because it blew out from the crash. And being a long keel boat, the keel didn't take too much damage, but I mean, it still was like one third of the keel was crushed, the rudder was damaged. And I often tell it this way, that a boat when constructed, it's, it becomes one, it's not multiple pieces anymore, but it's one altogether. And by an impact of that size, it just goes everywhere. The explosion just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was visible everywhere, even in the, in the most forward spot. It hit, on, it hit in the back, but yeah, it just uh, blew out everything. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is uh, all the experts that I knew at the time, I asked them if I should do it or not. And they all told me to run away and don't even think about it. <laughs> but I guess that's what also fueled my motivation to do it. 
So there's there's lots of people out there who have a bit of a dream. You know, you have people who buy a house that's a wreck and then they renovate it and turn it into their dream home. And there's people who have the same uh, like willingness or desire to do the same with a sailing boat. What what do you know now that you wish you knew before you started renovating the magic carpet boat? Hmm. Well, it just became uh, even more of a passion right now and knowing that I was able to do it uh, within a reasonable amount of time and now I get to like eat the fruits from all that labor, I would do it again, even if uh, it really was a tough time because it was four years only working on it without even knowing how does it perform, how does it sail, how will it be at the end. So that is really tough when you don't know it from the beginning. But now that it was all worth it, yeah, I would do it again. What What do you wish? You, what do you know now, Maya, that you wish you knew beforehand? Like before Magic Carpet, or before my uh -huh. boat, or yeah, anything, I, anytime. You 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 choose. Hmm. I think that. We are really lucky, and I think maybe a lot of people listening to this podcast are really lucky to be in the position of, you know, coming from places where if you put your mind to something, you can make it happen. And I think that that's what I've learned above all in all of this is like from a 13 year old picking a book off the shelf in the library and being like, I want to do this. And now to having that happen, I think that. Yeah, that's that's the biggest takeaway I've gotten is that when you really want something, you can make it possible and you'll have to sacrifice many other things. Like there's many things in my life that I left behind, for example, my entire country and my friends and my family that I grew up with. Not that I never see them anymore, but um, it is possible to make your dream come true with enough work and, and if you really go for it. So that's what I think I've taken away overall yeah, totally. from this whole experience. And what's that tipping point? Because lots of people have powerful dreams or goals or whatever you want to call it. And very few people actually turn them into a reality. Very few people live it. What's, what's that tipping point that tips you over from it being a goal and a desire into it, now I'm going to make this my reality? I think that for me, and I'll let Aladino speak about this um, for himself, but I think that for me, it's all come down to a few big pivotal choices. And those are different in everybody's life. But I think in, in almost everyone's life, you have to make really difficult decisions at one time or another, whatever that decision is. And how you make those decisions obviously impacts the rest of your life. And so for me, when I was you know 18, I had the really huge and very difficult decision of, am I going to take on this boat that's been offered to me for a dollar? Because of course, a $1 boat is not actually a dollar. It comes with a lot of costs and a lot of responsibility on top of that. And it's, that, it's those kind of pivotal moments of like, am I or am I not? And you just have to sit with yourself and think, if I reject this offer, this thing that I've been kind of dreaming about, Am I going to regret it? And and if I do accept it, am I also going to regret it? You know, there's always that as well. Like, is this a project that's not right for me at this time? So it comes down to those pivotal moments and just really thinking it through clearly for yourself and deciding what the best choice is. And I think another thing I've learned through this whole process, I've said this in a YouTube video before, is that any time you make a choice, you are going to be leaving other things behind. That's why choices are so difficult. Because anytime you make any choice, it means there's another road you're not taking. And that's really hard to reconcile at times. But you have to, you have to weigh those paths and, and decide what's going to make you the happiest in the long run. And I think that's what Aladino and I have, have done fairly successfully up until this point i would say i think yeah, we're both absolutely. pretty happy with the choices that we made that allowed us to get here mm, cool how about you aladina well yeah similar but you definitely have to be be a bit brave and um yeah it definitely takes uh takes a takes a bit of that and also not to give up quickly but to give it um a few goes 
because many times, uh, yeah, you try once or twice and it might not lead anywhere or might not work out as you thought, but just uh, keep trying. And I will also say that we were really lucky to find these passions at the time of life when we did, because I mean, we both, we didn't have careers, per se. we didn't have children, we didn't have partners even at that time. So we did have that freedom to kind of just be like, well, I think this seems like a good decision and just go for it. And I recognize that that's not always the case. You know, we were unique in that, in that position, but um, to make these choices that will get you into the outdoors more, it doesn't always have to be this huge one where you move across the world. You know, um, it can be a much smaller one. Like your friend says, let's go climb this mountain on the weekend. And you're like, well, I don't know, I've got this event, whatever. Um, but then you decide to go and that's a memory you'll have for the rest of your life is climbing that mountain and all the stories that transpire along the way. So yeah, it doesn't have to be such a big decision every time, but just. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. a succession of uh, small steps. Yeah. yeah. Cool. You mentioned the word story there and bravely, uh, you guys document your entire life on YouTube. Um, well, I don't know whether it's your entire life, but it feels like it on occasion. It's like big chunks of your world. Um, mm -hmm. And that's brave to share that uh, of you because that, that puts you up there for people to love you and also to like not be so positive at the same time. So mm -hmm. well done for being so brave. What is, how do you balance that though between um, sharing enough so people feel like they're part of your world and on the journey with you, but still having some degree of privacy um, and enjoying the the sea and the boat and everything else for yourself? I think it's a balance we're still working on, um, but I think it's an easier balance to strike than you might think, just because it's not like this sort of TV production where we've got a camera crew following us around and someone in an editing room making all the shots. Like we are totally in charge of our own story. And so it never really feels like invasive in any kind of way because we can decide exactly what we want to show and tell. And, and I think to us, I mean, at least to me, it doesn't necessarily feel like we are putting our whole lives out there. Um, I mean, we're filming often but there's so much time in every day and so many things that happen off camera that it feels like there's still a lot sort of beh up behind the scenes of just us going about our daily life so i feel like youtube gives a lot of power to the creators to share the story in the way that they want to and still have their lives to live and kind of go at it by their own terms so it's it's been a huge asset to our adventures i think um Another point about that that I've found actually really positive is that it's given me a bit of incentive to follow through on things I've always wanted to do. I mean, I think everyone has a list of things of like they'd want to be more like this or they'd want to do more things like this. Or, you know, everyone's got that list of like, yeah, those sort of resolution-y sort of things. And I, I do think, for me at least, and of course everyone's different, that having that sort of public forum has made me more conscious of just how I live for the better um, because I I know that if I just like go about whatever I'm doing without thinking about it or without putting any thought into it that it's it's going to be seen by a larger audience and so I think it's made me more conscious and I think that's a really really good thing I feel really good about that so yeah I already know what you think well yeah it's definitely also how you make it and I think uh we give ourselves um, a lot of freedom in that. Well, I mean, there uh, all the roses go to your part of the work, but as you said, the cameras are not on us twenty four seven. It's not like a TV show where it's just let's see what happens in the in the whole twenty four hour range. But it's more of we are creating our journal, and it's also um, it's also for us to remember in the future, like before they were only like written journals and entries of your adventures and instead now it's uh, videos about it mm -hmm. but you have a lot of power into how you create those journals i mean of course mostly like it's not made up stuff so of course it's also still what happens and the pressure is more on the more you film the more you can capture of all of that so you do have to have it in your mind to always have the camera ready and 
because yeah, most of the times the most the most amazing things happens happen off camera. So it's more that you have to get in that mindset of always having the camera ready and just knowing that yeah, it might always be around the corner mm -hmm. and you have to record it. And mm -hmm. we want to record it. So it's uh, more of a, something to get used to since it's not, yeah, supernatural from the beginning. Yeah. And I'll say one more thing about that is that um, I think the benefits of being able to share our lives with our audience so far outweigh any like really minor little cons. Like there's, there's not really a lot of mm -hmm. cons that I can really think of. Um, but the benefits are so awesome because, I mean, we have now friends all over the world like even just being able to talk to you now right now rob like we would never have met you if it weren't for this youtube channel um and there's so many people like that that we met during our travels um and who we invited on board the boat who we got to spend a weekend with who are amazing people that only came about because of this channel so it's just been a really beautiful way to build community as well Come Completely. I actually call it a, a, a bit of a circle because it's also us trying to motivate, but at the same time, it does motivate us a lot. So it, it's very much a circle of uh, giving and taking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. And, and you mentioned a minute ago about always having a camera ready. For, for each of you, what's been the, the missed moment that you really wish you had got to film? Oh my gosh, I just edited it. <laughs> yeah, best example is it gonna happen today. Oh. Yeah, I think by the time this podcast comes out, the video might be out already because it's coming out um, next week. But we were at, on the south of Sicily. We went through this very intense lightning storm. And we did actually film it. it. It was probably the most scared I've ever been on the boat. And we did actually film it, but we lost all the footage somehow. It's the first time and last time that we've lost footage. And I still don't really know what happened. There was some kind of magic from the lightning. I have no idea what went on there. But yeah, I'm very bummed about that. But that's okay. <laughs> I managed to tell the story in another way, but it's a pity we lost. All that yeah, footage. totally. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, there, there, there's many examples like that. Um, as, as I think about it more, they will pop up. But uh, one important one that comes to mind right now is I, I'm really gutted that I didn't film anything during the restoration oh, process. Yeah, sure. And that's a big part of our story, but we only had to share it through photos because uh, I, was, I was in the mindset of repairing and working and not of uh, sharing and filming at the time. And I, I hadn't met Elodino at that point, so I wasn't there to film. Exactly. So I documented everything with photos, but it was more of a personal thing to remember how were things and how could I put them back together again. <laughs> yeah, and I really regretted that. That's cool. You can tell that story in other ways. In fact, you already have got a couple of videos out there telling that story about restoring the boat. Um, yeah, Maya did a fantastic job there. Yeah, yeah, that was very, 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 very powerful. Um, so I saw in a previous one of your previous videos, you were looking at a um, another shipwreck, um, and and is is magic carpet big enough for your adventures that you want to go and have is there another boat on the horizon at some point in time um tell me so actually uh both of those are true uh magic carpet would be big enough but also we are actually currently uh, not 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 very actively looking but since now that we've been doing this for two years and we decided we want to keep doing this for at least 10 years. <laughs> Why not uh, on a bit of bigger boat, for sure, yeah. I think I think it comes down to like, yes, Magic Carpet totally is capable of going around the world if, if we wanted her to. Um, but it's also different, like it's, it's our home. Literally everything we own is on board, my instruments and all of our camera equipment, and we have to have enough water on board, and it would be more comfortable to have a larger boat. So we are looking into that. And uh, I think Aladino is kind of excited for maybe doing another refit sometime yeah, soon as, as well. As funny as it seems, but I do get it cheap for another project. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there, there is always things to do, but yeah, there's multiple reasons. All the amazing people that we keep meeting, like why not have them on board one day? And yeah, it's a, it's a whole chain of reasons that actually, why not? On one side, um, it will probably be one of the saddest days of saying goodbye since um, it is our beloved home. 
but also yeah we are we are sometimes looking around mm -hmm. That's cool. Tell me, for those people who don't know out there and haven't followed you on YouTube, uh, which is probably 99% of the people listening to it, tell me about Magic Carpet. How big is it? What type of boat is it? Um, just so people can understand, when you say we'd like to live on something a little bigger, what, what really do you mean by that? Sure, that's a good point, actually. So right now, Magic Carpet is a Swedish-built Vinde. Um, it's called the Vinde 32, which refers to sail area, though, like in many Scandinavian boats and not to the boat length. But actually, she is nine meters long, which uh, translates to 28 feet. And um, the traditional boats, well, she's from 76, so they are not very roomy inside. They are quite narrow and pointy. And she is a long keel boat which means uh, quite sturdy and safe and we can hit things, but, yeah. we, but we don't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, pretty much um, nine feet wide, well, less than nine feet and 28 long. That's about it. And it's perfect for two people. We actually tried four quite often and it works for a short while as well, but it's perfectly set up for two. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what, what would you look for in the, we call it Magic Carpet 2? What's, uh, what's that dream? Oh, that's a very difficult question. It changes almost every week because um, for, for the listeners who, who aren't familiar with boat shopping or have never gone down that rabbit hole before, it really is a rabbit hole because every single design feature on a boat is a compromise. If you want more room, then you're going to have less speed. If you want more this, you're going to have less that. And so... When you're living on board a boat, you're buying a totally different kind of vessel than if you're wanting to break a speed record or, or something like that. It's kind of like the difference between buying a Lamborghini and buying an old VW bus or something. You know, There's all these different kinds of boat models that to choose from. So for us, we, we are less interested in speed. Uh, we're more interested in a good, sturdy boat. Um, but we're also a little bit picky about picky. Uh, beauty, I would yeah. say. <laughs> I think one thing we didn't mention about Magic Carpet is she has a really eye-catching boat. She's really beautiful. Aladino did a beautiful job restoring her, and uh, she's got this gorgeous mahogany cabin top and teak decks, and so we are a little bit, I think, vain about yeah. <laughs> wanting our boat Spoiled. to be pretty, um, and Aladino's boat building skills come in handy for making that happen, so... Those are kind of the things we're looking at. Something practical, something strong, something with a sense of traditional beauty to it. Yeah, but we are still somehow staying realistic that um, too much size, uh, too much increasing the size also comes in increasing the costs and uh, making handling more difficult or needing more gadgets to do so. And that's all more maintenance. So yeah, just to put it down in numbers, uh, we pr more or less told ourselves that uh, 40 feet would be a pretty good high high end size. Maximum and, size. And yeah, everything from like 36 feet to 40 becomes, depending on the design, very roomy and comfortable with many extras. Yeah. Yeah. And so a magic carpet doesn't have a lot of the shiny toys and whistles and bells that a lot of other uh, very modern boats have. Um, what is there that you would really like in terms of shiny toys? And by that, I mean things like, I don't think you guys have a water maker. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what, 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 no, you're right. what, what would be on your like little bucket list of thing, shiny things that we'd like to include on a new boat? I think honestly, just the water maker. Well, um, I see it less in gadgets like the water maker, but, um, and I think this is the right place to say it now here on this podcast is actually, we would like more, like hiking gear and the canoe, an inflatable <laughs> canoe, and what about some climbing stuff, the harness and a few ropes, because by being out there, like, we already have so much and we see such incredible places, but sometimes, uh, yeah, it would also be nice to, yeah, do the climbing in the region or do the, the canoeing down those uh, rivers. So all those, uh, all those things that come with the adventure yeah, that's very true. Having more space to store things because space is really limited on Magic Carpet right now. So, I mean, even our our wardrobe is absolutely tiny. I have two small shelves of clothes and that's it. So everything is just very minimal right now. And it would be really cool to have like 
sleeping bags and tents and everything we need to just mm-hmm. go on big adventures. But other than that, I do think a water maker would be really great. And that also ties into the whole being able to go on longer adventures. Um, and just in case someone's not familiar, a water maker just means uh, it's this device which sucks in salt water and it removes the salt and it gives you fresh water to fill up your tanks with, which is a really awesome gadget, which allows you to stay out of civilization for long periods of time and be totally self-reliant. Exactly, self-reliance. So all gadgets that would improve and help that since sailing is all about that. So yeah. that would be like, uh, yeah, more solar and a water maker. But mostly also, as I said, it's cool to bring people along to share the adventures with. And yeah, uh, having more diesel and fuel um, for sure. Uh, I mean, water, you can stay away longer. And I mean, also diesel and fuel. Yeah, you, do, you do sometimes need that for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's not always wind. Mm-hmm. No, I, totally. I found, I found having, um, having guests along on things creates its own level of headaches. So quite often when I've been on on expeditions, you know, you don't worry about time. Like you've got three months and your time is just an open void and you just fill it as the mm-hmm. as, as the weather, I suppose, as Mother Nature lets you fill it. So some days you might go a long way, other days you might go a short day. But the moment you include other people in who are time limited into a seven day or 14 day window, suddenly you have to be somewhere for them to get a cab to the airport or whatever else. And I guess that's that's a bit of a... A struggle I suppose with a sailing boat. That's absolutely true and I think so many sailors always give the advice that if you're going to have guests on board they are the ones that have to be flexible because like we don't always have a lot of flexibility we can't just go meet you at an island if there's a big storm brewing we're not just going to beat through the storm and hope it all goes well you know so so yeah you have to have flexible guests and and you have to be a bit flexible yourself um And we have found it to be worth it. Like, I love having my friends on board. That's something we can talk more about later is is, um, one of the sacrifices of the long-term sailing lifestyle is that you you do leave behind your community of people that you know and love. So it is really nice having guests on board and friends from back home. So it's worth the the headaches, I say. But yeah, flexibility is very important on both both ends. And I would say it creates for headaches maybe before, but we always managed and it was always worth it in the end. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because it's a funny old thing because you, you two as a couple, you, you live in each other's pockets. Like if you disagree mm. with each other, there's a, you're in the middle of the sea. There's not a lot of space to go and get some hiding space. How do you, how do you manage that and keep your relationship happy and healthy while living in each other's pockets? Um, I guess we're just a perfect fit for each other <laughs> because... <laughs> I, I think that is really difficult at times but we are really lucky in that it's not so difficult for us so I feel like I'm, I'm not super qualified to give advice on this but I would say that taking alone time even if you're not alone is important so often we'll just have our headphones on we listen to podcasts or audiobooks or whatever and I also think that our uh tasks on the boat are quite clearly divided. Aladino is a boat builder by profession, like he actually has a an apprenticeship that he finished, he got the certificate, did the exams in Switzerland. So he's he's kind of in charge of taking care of the boat, whereas I'm in charge of doing the videos. And I think having that clear delineation between what you do is really helpful um, because then you're not always endlessly discussing and disagreeing and agreeing and arguing over whatever task you're trying to both get done at once. So I think that's very helpful as well. Yeah. Mm. No, it's just, I, I have a feeling like a, a boat, a boat's a little bit like a desert island. Like when you're on it, you're on it. And there's not a lot, not a lot of getting off it. Absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. Awesome. Um, so tell me where, whereabouts you've mostly sailed from what I can work out, mostly around the Mediterranean and obviously the canal systems of Europe. What's the most amazing mm-hmm. place that you've both indiv- individually been to? What's the place that sticks into your head? That if somebody was to say, I'm going to go sailing in the Mediterranean or in Europe, you would say to them, you have to go here. Ooh. Yeah, it's, it's always hard because there's like different reasons to go to each spot. But 
I will yeah, as say as soon as we start talking about it, like every 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 second place we mention it, like oh yeah, right, and then we thought about that yeah. one. Oh, and what about ah? It gets difficult. There's so <laughs> many places, but I I do think the Aeolian Islands just north of Sicily were pretty cool. Those are these small volcanic islands just north of Sicily. They do get really busy in the summer, but so does everywhere in the Mediterranean. Um, and yeah, you can see a live volcano erupting in front of you, and you can go on these incredible hikes and. I think those were pretty cool islands. What about you, Dean? Yeah. Well, for four years, I kept uh, always going back to Sardinia, um, also with my the boat I had before, Magic Carpet. So that's a bit my 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 sailing region I know the best, Your but go-to. my go-to place. But I keep discovering new ones. Uh, I absolutely loved the rugged north coast of Menorca also. It was just a short visit uh, before we sailed to Barcelona, but there we, we saw some incredible caves. Uh, that was formations. rock formations and caves. That was really amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, there are so many places. And <laughs> just now, uh, around the corner from where I started almost every adventure, just around Marseille, on the French coast, we discovered a place now which, yeah, was also quite dreamy. Was the the Calan. Um, it's this park on the French coast, yeah, pretty close to Marseille, and it's just this amazing place. It's got these little fjords that you can anchor in, and then you can take your dinghy or your rowboat to the beach. You leave your boat on the beach, and then you can go hike up into these stunning mountains. So it was just like this absolute paradise. There's a lot of climbers that go to that area as well and so you could be on the boat and then you could go hike way up into the mountains and that was pretty great I mean coming from the west coast of Canada where it's all about sea to sky I really felt at home there of just the mountains and the sea and it's all wrapped up together so that's also a very special place totally yeah so I guess it also really depends on uh what's your what's your main passion is it climbing then it's that place um one of my uh, recent passions is free diving and instead, for for that purpose, I was totally blown away by the island of Ustica, which is uh, just north of Sicily, so kind of in between Sardinia and Sicily. And when I went diving there, I was totally blown away by by the just just how the rock formations they they just plummet down, they come they come up from from. So deep down in the ocean, and there's there's quite some big fish. I was very impressed. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and how is the fish population in the Mediterranean now? I've heard all sorts of things about the med being overfished and the fish population being very small. Is, is that true? Is that what you experience, um, or is it worse than what people say? I think that is definitely true. I think there are not a lot of fish here. And to be honest, I haven't spent so much time in other areas of the world other than BC. And I mean, BC, there are more fish. So that's kind of the only comparison I have, but it does seem like there's there's very few fish in the Mediterranean. Um, yeah, and, and I think from other sailing channels that we sometimes watch who have been to more varied locations and have tried spear fishing in these other locations, they all say that the Med is, is quite overfished. I mean, it's a very populated sea, so yeah. That's that's a bit sad. Yeah, I totally agree there. And um, well, I've been a bit watching, seeing, and comparing it since I was little, because my one of my biggest passions was always fishing. And uh, I remember, yeah, just just by remembering, I've seen sizes, uh, the averages get smaller, and just quantity get smaller as well. Yeah. Yeah. Such a shame. I wonder what it is we can do about that. But uh, I guess we can't find the answer for that right here, right now. Um, so there's many people like me who um, are in fully intending on buying a boat and sailing around the world with their family. And by the way, that's my 2023 goal is to set sail from South yeah. Africa. Awesome. Uh, Congratulations. Go, Keep in touch yeah. with us about that one. Yeah. I, I will do. Um, yeah. Anyway, South Africa to Brazil via San Helena in the Ascensions and then who knows where after that. But that's the goal. Now, really? um, I, I've been playing in the outdoors probably like you guys, since I was a very small child. And I'm well aware that you can go on all of the courses, you can read all of the books, and yet you still go and get in a boat to go and start sailing somewhere, and you realize that actually you haven't, there's still lots to learn. 
what what do you guys think that people should really focus on learning that maybe isn't in books or isn't spoken about that much that would enhance their people's time to promote? Um, I'm going to say that I think the most important thing is knowing your own boat, the boat that you're sailing on, how to fix it, having the tools on board in order to do that. Because sailing itself, um, there is a lot that goes into seamanship for sure. There is so much of, of knowing how to handle your own boat, but at the same time, a lot of safety at sea and a lot of uh, the biggest challenges that sailors often face is when things go wrong with the boat. And that happens so often because you're in these really, really harsh conditions and having the skills to fix your boat on the go, I think is the biggest thing. And uh, that's why I'm so lucky to sail with Aladino who has such a wide amount of skills and knowledge on this topic. And, and I can learn from him as well. But I, I think that's important, not only for, yeah, just how comfortable you are on the boat, but just your own safety. If you're crossing an ocean, you need to know how to fix your boat. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, but also, oh yeah, we we know some examples. Then they over prepare and they overthink and they never go. So it's a bit of both. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to tell because we know some. They actually leave without knowing much, and they learn on along the way. And I guess uh, that's good for some, but it's um, definitely not our go-to. I was just from the beginning super passionate and I wouldn't do anything else but reading about sailing, dreaming about sailing. But the most important is get the theory, yes, but then uh, transform it into practical things. You have to try it with your hands and actually actually go and do it. Yeah, I guess it really is a mix. You, you have to get both the theory and the practical. It, it's not one of those things where you can be like, oh, you can have one or the other. They both have to be married together, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Totally, uh, but pe people can talk about wind strength or wave height and uh, the theory of what to do when the wind's strong or the waves are big is very very different from when the wind's blowing at 30 knots and you are, have got seas in the meters of height and um, mm -hmm. like that whole I suppose psychology of how you manage yourself when frankly it's all starting to get a bit scary that, that takes quite a while to acquire I thought yeah, it does. And that's why you need like both the practical and the theory side. Because I mean, if you're out there and you have no theory and you find yourself in this huge sea and you've got no kind of knowledge to fall back on, I think that can also be really, really scary. And and yeah, like you said, if you're if, even if you do have the theory that first time, it's still going to be scary, but at least you have that kind of practical knowledge to fall back on. Think, okay, well, at least this is the the idea of what I should be doing here, and then you try it out and then once you try it out, then you start to uh, trust yourself more, trust your boat more, and understand how to react in such situations. But yeah, I, I really think it's important to to read books and try it yourself and go. And, and the first few times you go out, like preferably go with someone who knows what they're doing so you can kind of watch and learn. It's not always possible, possible but I think that's a really good way to learn as well. Cool. So just moving sideways slightly, um, Maya, um, I want to compliment you on being such a talented uh, musician with your violin. How, um, wh where did all that start from for you? And, and the, the next part of that is, um, how do you keep your instruments, um, I'm just going to use the word healthy, but like, okay. yeah, healthy, healthy in what must be a fairly damp environment, well, not damp, it may be a fairly damp environment of being so close to the water the entire time. Yeah, uh, okay, well, the first part of how I got started with the music, I've been playing since I was three years old, and it was, it was actually kind of a similar story of how I got into sailing, like, I saw a, my mom took me to this concert of local youth fiddlers when I was two, and apparently I came home, my dad hadn't gone to the concert, I came home and I stood in the kitchen, and the name of this group was the Coast String Fiddlers, and I stood in the kitchen with my hands on my hips, and I was like, Dad, I want to be a Coast String Fiddler. And so I did. And so <laughs> when I was three, my parents got me my first violin and I never looked back. So that's how I got started with that. Um, as for having the instruments on the boat, it is something I worry about a little bit. And I def I haven't taken like good violin. I do have a very nice violin in Canada and I, I leave it in Canada. So I have kind of like a cheaper student violin on the boat. Um, but as for the humidity thing, I mean, it's never like it's soaking wet in the boat. You know, it's it's dry. Mm. We're around water, but the boat is dry. And 
for instruments, it's actually more damaging to be in really dry conditions than to be in slightly humid ones. Um, so I haven't worried about it too much. And I think the fact that I didn't bring a really nice violin with me kind of helps me to not worry about it. I would be a lot more worried if I had one. But yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, I try to keep it out of the sun, obviously keep it dry, try not to get salt on it. But other than that, I mean, they can, they can withstand a good amount. Mm. And on your website or your channel, there's loads of places people can go and listen to you play. That's right, isn't it? Uh, kind of. I've, I've released one single so far, so it's on Spotify. Uh, but, but yeah, often in the videos, I include clips of me playing on the bow or whatever. Uh, as we're sailing along, I often take my instruments out and start to play a little bit, and then Aladino films for me. So that's always peppered in throughout the videos. Uh, I was wondering, Aladino, whether you'd be learning to play an instrument soon. I actually thought about it, but I didn't really try yet. Uh, I might still, and that would be the guitar, because now we have one on board. I gave one to Maya for her birthday. Yeah. And uh, so now I have, I have the option to actually give it a go, but I haven't yet. Because there's just too many things, too many things. And yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I have uh, so many passions that it's hard splitting up. And honestly, also, yeah, it's it, it's a challenge uh, starting from scratch and having a teacher who, who knows quite a lot about it. It's uh, it's not the most motivating way. <laughs> well, that's not, to be fair, Alan, you know, is a very, very smart and very motivated man, as I'm sure you can probably tell from what he did with Magic a bit. Um, and so the first time he tried to learn guitar, he sat down on the beach and he wasn't instantly Santana. And after 15 <laughs> minutes, when he realized he wasn't Santana, all of a I sudden gave up, he yeah. gave up because he's like, oh, well, I'm not good at this. I was like, well, you know, Aladino, if you became Santana after 15 minutes, I would actually be quite upset at you. So I've spent a long time trying to learn all this. That's, um, <laughs> that's why I just takes more it more, takes more patience at it, of course yeah patience yeah. is required for sure well i guess yeah. um sailing one of those things where it's a um yeah uh, either you're very busy or you're not busy at all i, I i'm assuming I've, I've sailed a fair amount but uh, and that's always been my experience and i i often found my my first sailing trip was six days in length and i think on day three i'd read my books i'd had nothing left to do and I just got insanely bored after a while and I think something like music or learning to play music can nicely fill that time yeah yeah in a way like I really like your definition of uh, either you're very busy or you're not at all and that is true but then at, on, on the other side when you're not busy to me it doesn't translate to being bored or having spare time because I can literally just sit and I'm so, so entertained by looking at the waves and listening to the waves. And there's always an, a distraction and then time goes by so quick. <laughs> yeah, I always feel pressed for time while also with all the video editing and stuff that takes up a huge amount of time. So I actually never feel like I have a lot of spare time. Um, but, but yeah, having those side projects is, is always important. And I think having those side projects is the reason why i don't feel like i have a lot of spare time because i always fill it with learning jazz theory or doing whatever else i'm interested in at the moment yeah and with me lately it was just focusing on free diving and spear fishing and fishing in general yeah mm -hmm. totally so I'll do that. Uh, I, I also go on i was gonna say free free diving is um you guys mentioned a rabbit hole of buying boats but free diving is a rabbit hole all on its own how far down the road of lung packing and all the breathing exercises have you got? Uh, nowhere, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. You're no, very good at it. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess. And it's just by by being there and doing it. But um, actually, uh, yeah, the next step should be buy a book or read something about it. Because um, the way I've always approached uh, adventure and outdoor was just by doing it and practicing but uh without having extra gear or buying extra equipment or courses and uh now that that's becoming an opportunity though i actually am really looking forward to it but but also by not doing it right away first i really know and pin down my passions and after a while i realized hey that's something i really should invest in because i keep doing it and i keep wanting to learn more 
yeah, just to give you an idea, Aladino started off the summer. Well, last year we didn't have fins at all because we just, yeah, last last year we really had no money. So we didn't have fins, uh, we didn't have weights, but we had like these kind of ankle weights uh, that we tied to a belt. And those were the, the free diving weights yeah. that we had. Um, we had this old wetsuit that a friend had given us. It was like 20 years old, but totally. it still did the trick. It had a few <laughs> holes, but we sewed it back up. So we just like made it work. And that's kind of how we've, how we've approached a lot of the, the things that we've done, I think, is not necessarily having the gear or the resources, but just going ahead and trying it. And then once we know it's something that will stick, then we'll start investing more in courses and gear and whatever else you need. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance, you should have a look at, um, on YouTube, uh, Wim Hof. He's a, a Dutch guy who has a whole load of breathing exercises that he does. Um, yeah, and I've heard of him. You can start um, I, on land. Um, I do his exercises every day, and I can hold my breath for about four minutes without having to... Wow. Without having to breathe, now, I'm sure underwater that would get that would change completely. But um, the exercises that he's got, and you can just go find them on YouTube, are really powerful in terms of saturating your body with oxygen, so your craving of air becomes less when you're under and stuff like that. It's well worth spending some time having a look at. Yeah, that's awesome. I've yeah. heard of Wim Hof for the cold exposure stuff he does, but I haven't really looked into the breathing stuff. That's really cool. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, it sounds like you're a uh, natural. Uh, four minutes, um, it does translate to less when you're on the water and moving. Especially me, I get so um, uh, just, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm just excited. so, yeah, I'm just so excited. And the excitement <laughs> is never good. And then I, I'm just happy looking at the fish and want to follow them. And that all kills the oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, four, four minutes on land is, is really good. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. There's um, there's guys who I've worked with who um, who can do it a lot longer than four minutes as well um, uh, on land. There, yeah, it's 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 quite cool. And uh, the nice thing with these exercises is it really chills you out, calms you down, and makes you just feel very very present in the moment. So you're not excited, but you're not sad. You're just like really nicely contented with where you are. And that's why I thought it would be good for free diving because. Um, I think being feeling contented with where, with where you are actually probably enable you to spend longer underneath the water. Yeah, that sounds absolutely correct. Totally, yeah. yeah. Go have Very a play. Nice. So you guys are in Zurich now. Uh, Magic Carpets mm -hmm. on a canal in the French French Canal system somewhere. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. We just left her about two days ago. It's just a few days before Christmas as we recorded this. So uh, we left her over Christmas, come visit family for a bit, and then we will return after the worst of winter has passed over to continue our journey. So what does continuing your journey look like? What's next? Um, our goal is to get up to the north. So we wanna go explore around Sweden next summer. And we decided, because the, the season up there is obviously a bit shorter, you can't just sail all year round. I mean, you can really tough but uh, we want to get up there for summer so we decided to take the rivers and canals through Europe over fall and winter and then arrive up in the north by spring and then we have the whole season to enjoy sailing around the, the northern countries Denmark and Sweden and stuff so that's the plan for next year I'm very excited about that. that have you been to Norway and Sweden before? I never have but Yes. Yeah, I was lucky to um, have seen some of the countries um, traveling with my parents. And also, um, as I mentioned, some of my biking trips, they also went up north. Mm. So, yeah, I'm very excited. It is, um, it is another beautiful place, but I've never seen it from the perspective of a sailboat. And that is the goal this time. Yeah. Wow, it is, uh, they're beautiful, absolutely beautiful places. You will absolutely love it. And of course, 24-hour daylight as well in the middle of summer is, um, is something very, very special. Yeah, I'm excited. Indeed, yeah, totally. Probably a, not. Uh, we will start off uh, further uh, south, but then we work our way up north and it will get more and more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you'll, you'll love it. I can't wait to see the videos. Um, I'm actually going to be in Norway canoeing next summer i might have to see if i can come and find you in sweden um oh brilliant do it yeah yeah please that, do <laughs> that, that would that would be amazing that would be absolutely amazing um you're welcome anytime thank you very very much just to go and fuel my sailing passion a little bit more i say passion it's more like an obsession if the truth's to be known um <laughs> yeah, that is true. excellent 
I Those are the best kind of fashions. <laughs> they are, aren't they? <laughs> when my wife says, what are you watching on YouTube? She doesn't even have to wait for the answer because she knows exactly what I'm watching. It'll be something to do with sailing. Um, yeah. So I have a few quick fire questions for you, um, uh, which I think both of you can answer individually. And um, some of them might not be that quick fire, but we'll see. Uh, so we'll start with some easy ones. Audio book or paper book? Uh, paper book? Dini? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Audio book. Audio book. Cool. Cool. Uh, a beer, wine, or whiskey? Wine. Beer. Beer. Huh? Good. Um, meat or salad? Salad. Salad. Oh. Favorite Harry Potter character? <laughs> oh. Oh my gosh, Aladino's not going to be able to answer this, but no. I, I have to go with Herm <laughs> Hermione. I love Hermione. Hermione. Aladino, have you not watched or read Harry Potter? Um, I have, but yeah, not, not, not into detail to remember any names. <laughs> oh. Just say Harry. Just say Harry. That's well, an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the housekeeper in the forest? That's oh, a, Hagrid. Hagrid. Oh, you, a nice would, guy. you would like Hagrid. He's a nice guy with his spider friends, yeah. Cool. Um, who's your sailing hero? Uh, Bernard Motissier or Tanya Ebe? Same, Bernard Motissier. Ooh. Uh, sorry, what was the surname again of Bernard? Motissier. He's a French sailor, and he... The reason why I really like him is because not only is he a sailor, he's also a really wonderful writer. And that always makes it more enjoyable to read about somebody's expeditions. But yeah, I would recommend looking up uh, his book, The Long Way. It's a beautiful just kind of ode to sailing and the crazy adventures that he went on. Cool. You know where I'm going on Amazon after we finish speaking. I'm going to go and get that book. Um, Perfect. Do it. You, yeah, you'll love it. Nice. Let's uh, recommend Alva Simon then as well. Oh, yeah. Alva Simon is uh, another author. He wrote a book called North to the Night, and it's another just beautiful ode to sailing and the spirit of adventure. And he actually went up to the Arctic and purposely got his boat stuck in the ice for the winter and spent an, a winter stuck in the ice up in the Arctic, fending off polar bears and whatnot and that's a really beautifully written book as well fending off polar bears wow yeah <laughs> literally <laughs> literally i had a friend of mine who um, circumnavigated svalbard in the north of Sw north of norway sorry in a sea kayak a couple of years ago wow. and that was one, wow. that was one of their biggest challenges it wasn't like the sea kayaking it wasn't the ice it wasn't the temperature polar bears yeah i believe it yeah absolutely this that's a crazy adventure though what a what a cool friend to have wow yeah totally oh, well, we're, we're also slowly planning to go up there it will not be for next season but it will be definitely one season mm -hmm. cool so guys um as we come to the end i just want to give you um 60 seconds for you to tell the world something that you that's important to you that you believe should be important to them as well um it can be anything you like um it could be a piece of advice it could be a rant or it could be a please stop doing this and start doing that it doesn't really matter what is it you'd like to use this platform to tell people so I assume that most of the people listening to this are outdoor enthusiasts. And yes. by being outdoor enthusiasts, you are one of the privileged people in the world to have this ability to build a relationship with nature. And when you build a relationship with nature, it makes you want to protect it. And so my one piece of advice is share your love of the outdoors with as many people as you can, because the more people grow to love nature, the more we can all work together to protect it and I think that's what you're doing with this podcast and I commend you for it and and yeah just everyone take your friends outdoors tell them stories about the outdoors and let's try and protect what we have here because mm. it's a very uh it's a very strong yet fragile thing at the same time isn't it absolutely yeah it's both of those things combined you're you're absolutely correct that totally. is cool and, and so the the last question I have for you guys is what do you predict the future of 
sailing or outdoor sport to be? What do you think the next big thing is going to be? It, it feels to me like cruising and liverboard sailing is getting more popular. But I don't know. What do you think the future brings? It's it's a really difficult question. And I mean, yeah, it is so hard for us to say, but I will say it's been really interesting to see the rise of people being able to make this lifestyle work long term due to the internet and being able to earn your living remotely. So I think that's been a really interesting change that's happened pretty recently in sailing and, and I guess other outdoor sports or anything where you can work from your laptop. Um, and I think it'll continue, but I think it might get more difficult as time goes on and the market gets more saturated. We're already seeing that start to happen. Um, so more more innovation and more like creativity and, and stuff will be needed in the future to make that kind of lifestyle work, I think. But yeah, I don't know. It's really hard to say. No, totally. Because mm-hmm. mm. I guess people, uh, if, if you want to have a laptop lifestyle of some sort um, and, and earn your money through the internet somehow, you really have to stand out as different from the crowd. When somebody types sailing into YouTube, you know, there's thousands of videos pop up. And yeah, how, exactly. How does, how does yours be the one that gets clicked on without becoming, without selling your soul at the same time? Cause I, I'm guessing you guys like me don't want to get involved in heavy amounts of clickbait or, um cheesy stuff you actually want to show what's real but nevertheless you have to attract people as well yeah that's a never-ending battle and i think if you ask any youtuber that's like their least favorite part of youtube because it is like the clickbaity stuff that gets the views but it's not the clickbaity stuff that gets the subscribers like the people who actually really want to follow you and it's it's really difficult um to to have those attention getting headlines that are at the same time honest and and tell what we're really about so yeah that, yeah. that's hard <laughs> i guess uh, yeah we are pretty lucky in that because uh, we didn't create a formula but we we, we can be who we are and uh, just by being who we are uh, we are lucky to actually have a little bit of an impact and uh, meet all these wonderful people and i guess that is the important thing is that you you just have to be who you are and eventually if you're consistent and if you're good, good people and you tell your story well and all of that then then it will happen for you. Yeah. Cool. Well, I just want to take a couple of seconds and just thank you guys for providing inspiration to the rest of the world. And I don't think you realize how much inspiration you put out there. The, the inspiration that it is possible to take a shipwreck and turn it into a beautiful boat that you live on. And then just to go and live on it, um, your story and what you produce touches thousands of people every week, if not every day. And um, I want to thank you for doing that because if if only three more people decide to go sailing and have a cooler lifestyle or a happier lifestyle for themselves because of it, I think that's a massive impact to have on planet Earth. And very few people encourage people to do cool, positive, happy stuff like you guys do. And um, I just want to thank you for that because I think it's really important. That is so sweet. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm grinning from ear to ear right now. <laughs> that's, that's really kind. And I mean, we have to throw it back at you for, for starting this podcast. I'm really impressed with the amount of work you've put into making it. And, and just the setup for this whole interview has been really professional and really well done. So Absolutely. congratulations for everything that you're doing as well. And you're doing exactly the same thing, inspiring thousands. So, yeah. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure. So I'm sure that people have heard your story now. They've engaged with you, with, uh, with you as individuals and Sailing Magic Carpet. If people want to find you, support you, um, listen to what you've got to do, watch you, anything, whereabouts can they best find you um, to do that? Well, definitely the best place to look is our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Sailing Magic Carpet, or you can just search for Sailing Magic Carpet on YouTube. We also have a website, which is sailingmagiccarpet.com. We have an Instagram, again, Sailing Magic Carpet, it's always the same. And if you have more specific inquiries uh, or comments, then you can send them to our email, which is sailingmagiccarpet at gmail.com. And that's pretty much it. Perfect. So the only apology I make for you giving your email address out is we have had somebody get swamped with emails. 
Oh, that's okay. We love receiving emails. As long as uh, usually the emails we receive, the people who actually bother to send an email rather than just leave a comment are usually really interesting and they're offering us some kind of partnership or opportunity or something. So hopefully those kind of emails come through. And, <laughs> and if you've just got like a, if you've just got like a one sentence thing, then maybe just leave a comment on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That is cool. All right, well, cool. That's uh, that's that's it from me. Um, I, I would like us to talk again at some point in time, but uh, I'm also well aware that being in a boat bobbing around on the ocean doesn't always leave itself to easy Wi-Fi access or anything else like that. So I guess we'll have to play that a bit by ear. But um, I have more questions, but I'm also aware that we've hit an hour and, and that's time for us to move on. So let's have a rematch at some point in time and uh, a second round on the podcast, if that would be all right with you. That sounds fantastic. And uh, I think I think for us and for all sailors and adventurers, last minute is always good because we never know where we're going to be every night. So send us an email, be like, hey, are you guys free tonight? And uh, And if we are, then we'll set up a podcast. Done. Well, just think about me in February or March. And when you get somewhere with Wi-Fi, just email me and say, Rob, we're here for the next two evenings. Can you make it work? And I'll make it work. Perfect. Sounds great. I look forward to it. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe, where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth and become part of a tribe of like-minded outdoor enthusiasts, sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips and insights, and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. Click on the link in the description below to join for free right now.